I believe that you truly are, that we are truly uh, living and going to heaven with some of the most incredible people Amen. in all the earth. I uh, don't use like, well, you have to say that. You're the pastor. I could pastor somewhere else. Amen. You're like, we could go somewhere else. So can I. It's a free world, baby. And I actually have dual citizenship. I got, the, I got all of Europe as an option to escape to. So I actually am the most free person in this room. And of all the people in this room, I'm saying this is the greatest place to be. So it must be the greatest place to be just based upon scientific merit of my presence here. And so God has been incredibly, incredibly good. And uh, one, one evidence of that is uh, last Sunday night as we gave uh, of who we are. And just an incredible revival. I, I loved on Friday night being able to share the statistics, uh, miracle numbers of explosive growth in the least likely place. What I love is that reports begin to trickle. And I don't get on the internet and brag, but I guess somebody does. Or people watch our live stream and sure enough... My phone will blow up, and they're like, I can't believe that that's going on in, in Vider, Texas. And, and I say, well, that's God and God's good people doing it in the least likely place. I'm going to tell you, if you ever wondered, well, I want to be a part of a revival church, guess what? You are part of a revival church. Well, I want to be a part of a place in, of harvest. You're in a part, place of harvest. It's a great season. It's a time of season. It's a time of victory. This is the time where the church is being prepared. And, and surely God is preparing his church for the rapture. And the last thing you'd want to do is miss out. The last time, the worst time that you could ever give up is right now. Amen. The worst, the worst time to, to quit is, is right before the victory and, and right before the rapture. Can you imagine the person that backslides the day before the rapture? I don't want to, come on somebody, I don't want to be that person. And if you give up today, you're per pretty much giving up on the day before the rapture. Hallelujah. And, and it continues. I'm excited. Tonight, we're going to be baptizing Nick and Brittany in the name of Jesus. Amen. I just married them in my office. And it's going to be a great, great night. If you're here and you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, tonight's your night. Amen. You can be baptized. You can be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. However, I love and I think that, that while we paint everything pink, we can also be real. For in every happy, there's always some sad. In every good, there's always some bad. And then if we neglect to address and see the negative, or not the negative, but perhaps the bad, we fail to learn from it. And so we must study and analyze the data from both sides. We must realize, and it's amazing, 254 new members in the last two years at Eastgate Church. That's an incredible, the, when you put it into percentages, that's an incredible percentage. Amen? However, my duty and responsibility is to also look at the other side. It's good to see how many are being born, but I also have to look and see how many are dying. And so tonight, I, I want to look at that. In the past two years, as I should have some screen pictures here. There's 254 new members. That's a good one. Give God praise for the good news. <laughs> And so tonight, tonight is, is, an, is, 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 is we look at this, it is so that we can learn from it. And I want to confirm as we hear the word of the Lord and look at some st statistics in the Bible lesson tonight to confirm. Because what happens is you walk out of the house after you just sacrificed and you gave. And the devil's like, oh man, you just giving it to him. And he's a, he's a liar. He's a, he's a filthy, rotten, good for nothing, condemner of the brethren. And so tonight, I'm just going to help you go home saying, no, I did the right thing. I'm doing the right thing. And that's based upon the evidence. And so in the past two years, 254 people, uh, member uh, uh, increase. In the past two years, we've had 36 people that have backslidden. These are not people that have moved, but are no longer living for the Lord. So tonight, I want to do a little, I would title it an autopsy of a backslider. We'll do a little autopsy based just upon numbers. Not to be negative, this isn't really even emotional, because really, numbers have no emotion. They're just numbers. Uh, but what I love, that's what I love about numbers. <laughs> is they're feelingless. They just give you data and uh, keep us honest. 36 deaths with hope of recovery. And so as we look at an autopsy, there's a few percentages of these numbers that I broke down and I've spent several hours in them. 
and that I want to relate to you and that I think will help you in your journey. Of the 36, 0% of them were accountable about church attendance. So they refused to let me or anyone know when they would be absent. That's something we can dissect from somebody that's dead spiritually. They're not accountable for where they are when church is happening. 3% of them served in ministry. That means 97% of them refused to be involved in ministry. Okay, it's a pretty interesting statistic. Shelby and I, we spent a lot of time today on this. 2% attended church fellowship. 0% went to work days. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? 2% of them helped serve in special events. That means one person we've, that worked at Light Up Vider. <laughs> 0% giving to alms. 2% gave to global missions. 0% gave to Eastgate Academy financially. 16% average church attendance. Okay? 0% taught a home Bible study. None of them taught a home Bible study. 2.8, 2.08, that's one. One a soul that's still here today. 0% participated in outreach. This is just, we're just, these are numbers. There ain't no, there's no feeling in it. It's just the facts. It's about the ones that left that are no longer living for God, that came to church and uh, are no longer with us. In those two years, their average weekly giving was $3.38. That's $1.12 per service. So they would give on an individual basis $175.18 a year. We're just doing the net numbers. Is that okay? Y'all okay? So of this group of 36, on a percentage basis, they used up, we looked at my calendar, 18% of my meeting time. Most of them were complaints and help of need and free counseling because obviously they weren't contributing. Okay? Um, they received in financial assistance in the form of school aid, food, clothing, transportation, and assistance $18,670 collectively. Their total collective in the two years was $12,659.58. So we received $12,659. We gave $18,670 for a net loss of $6,1042. So annually, we lost, on these backsliders, $3,005.21 a year. I save an average of one hour a week with them absent. Many of them leave with this attitude of, well, the church isn't going to make it without me. When the truth is, we're actually saving time and money without you. Come on. Look, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not naming names, and I'm not happy about it. I, I mean, if, I, if you tell me, Pastor, give me 10000 bucks, and they'll come back, and they'll get saved, I'll, give you, I'll write the check tonight. This ain't about the money. This is just about you, not about them. This is about us that remain and how we can make it to heaven. And I do believe in Jesus' name that they will come home. As it's for our benefit to dissect, cut open the spiritual condition so we can learn what they died of. Because I don't want to die of it. Does that make sense? And here's the first observation I have. They did not give themselves to death. They received themselves to death. I can't afford to give. Now, hold on. The numbers actually favor them receiving over giving. And what ends up happening is they receive so much, they literally drowned and died. Does that make sense? People do not leave because they're not receiving. That church don't do nothing for me. No, they're leaving because they're not giving. I said they're leaving because they're not giving giving and I can tell you something that while I have numbers on the past two years 24 months that I knew this to be true and I think dad can sit there and bob his head and say I might not have done these I didn't you didn't have the time probably to go into this type of study brother Smith you didn't have the time but as a whole you knew you just knew that every person that backslid you pull the tithing record they ain't pull the number one complainers they're not given the number one they're not involved they don't serve they're too holy to get involved and be an usher they're too spiritual to be on the serve team they're too and they never last 
okay? What are you saying? I'm saying that when you game Sunday night and you said, I'm gonna give more than I ever have before, you were saying, I'm gonna live like I never have before. That's what, that's the message tonight. That's the message tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so as I'm studying this out, this whole week, I come to this incredible conclusion that to keep you healthy and to keep our church healthy and to keep me saved and to keep us saved, there's a thing I do not preach enough about. It's a failure. I don't preach enough about giving. You're like, oh, Lord. But if you just heard those statistics, you'd be saying, no, preacher. Preach about giving because giving is equal to living. I'm not going to be a dead sea. I'm not going to be somebody that dies. Preach to me how to live. Preach, come on, if I was preaching how to praise, if I was preaching how to have a better marriage, if I was preaching how to ha shout hallelujah and run the aisles, we're all up, woo hoo yee-haw, woo -hoo. But when I'm telling you that the way you live and the way you make it isn't by what you get. Well, I don't get revelation. No, it's by what you give. Matthew 6 and 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I love that passage. It's familiar to all of us. But where your treasure is, there where is where your heart is. Giving. Where you give. Oh man, that's why we walked out of this thing and we do every Beyond Borders. We walk out of this thing saying that was the greatest weekend of the year. Greatest weekend I've ever been a part of. Wow, can you not see the link? Every year that's the biggest giving Sunday of our year and you say that's the greatest Sunday of the year do you see the core come on whether it's Kenny Carpenter preaching brother Mapufu preaching Jimmy Tony preaching Josh Herring preaching that doesn't matter what's making it great is you're coming saying I'm gonna give I'm, but what if we turned it from just one Sunday and said, I'm going to make my life a giving mechanism that on Monday, I'm going to be giving of myself. Uh, on Tuesday, I'm going to be giving of myself. In my marriage, I'm going to be giving. And guess what will happen? You don't have to just have one good Sunday a year. You can have a life uh, that's rich and full of the gifts and favor of God. What a blessing. Where your treasure is. Well, I don't know about all that giving. Well, giving and the word give is in your Bible 811 times. Praise is, I got some, some of this. Praise, 216. That means that 275% more is said about giving than praising. Worship, 102 times versus giving. 695 times more. Come on. Sing, 101. Give, 702 times more. That's an incredible number. Continue. Clap. But oh, we love to clap. Come on. Oh boy, come on, clap all you people, clap. Boy, we're clappers. If I say clap, boy, let's do it. Come on, somebody. Give. 13,000 times more important is giving. I'm not saying stop clapping. I'm just saying that if you're going to clap, we also got to give that the joy that every person, come on, all 36 of those people clapped. They're not here tonight. What they failed to do was give. They didn't give of their service. They didn't give of their talent. And they didn't give of their treasure. They didn't give of their time. And they're dead. I'm not going to be dead. Come on, somebody. Uh, I'm going to live. Preach. Oh, I want to preach. I want to preach. Really? Then you need to give. Come on, somebody. Dance 10,000 times. Isn't that incredible? Love, 189%. Pray, three, uh, 165. Isn't that incredible? The word money is in your Bible 123 times. Look at your neighbor and say 123. Again. 123 verses clap 6, dance 8, shout 31, run 65, tongues 34, long hair 2, beard 15, preaching 27, ministry 22, lead 60, teach 106. But, but boy, if I send out a text, who, who wants to be a preacher? Ooh, I'll preach. Come on, somebody. Who, who'll teach? Who'll lead? Who'll sing the song? Come on, I can get you riled up just preaching about hair. 
I said, I can get you running the aisles, jumping on your left hair, preaching about hair. If you can get that excited about hair and beards and shouting and dancing, we ought to get that excited about giving. It is that much more important than anything else. We're, we're getting to a place of maturity where giving becomes what's the greatest part of who we are. He truly loves a cheerful. He didn't say you had to clap cheerful. Come on, he didn't say you had to dance cheerful. He said, if you're gonna give, you're gonna give cheerfully. He said, I love it when it's done cheerfully. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And so it has nothing to do with what they failed to receive. It has everything to do with what they failed to give. Jesus spoke more about giving than any other subject. That's incredible, amen? No doubt it's because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. My money is not chasing the dance. My dance follows the money. I don't shout, come on, and then put money in. I put money in and I shout. I put my service into it, my time, my energy, my thing. When I've got my money in it, when I've got my time in it, when I've got my inner, when, when I have everything I, I, I did I made, it, I, made, I made maybe maybe it's a good decision I haven't decided yet oops feels better today I bought Bitcoin now I'm going to tell you when I buy Bitcoins and stocks I should send out a church message and say hey guys it's about to tank <laughs> I, I, can, I can forecast stock if I buy it it will be worth half the next day so if I buy Ford tomorrow, y'all just hold off one day, buy Ford the next day. You can wait till the next day, and it'll bump up a little, but it's amazing. So I basically bought Bitcoin when everybody's like, oh, it's going to the moon. It's going to be a million dollars. It's going to, yeah, da, da, da. I'm like, all right, well, I'll buy some of this stuff. My goodness, I'm jumping on that Bitcoin train. I don't know what it is either, but, you know, I'm going to get rich without working. I'm into that. But the Bible is true. you got to work to make money. I tell you what, it proved me God's word was right again. And I mean, when I say I bought some Bitcoin, Brother Kevin, I ain't talking about like, you know, I'm talking like I was going to pay off the building, kind of. I'm, I'm not normally stupid, but I had a stupid moment. And that Bitcoin went, whoosh. and if you want to know what Bitcoin's at right now, just ask me. And if you want to know what it out yesterday, just ask me. And if tonight, maybe at four o'clock in the morning, you just text me, what's Bitcoin at? I probably know. You know why I know? Because I check it all the time. I got little alerts that when it goes up, it ding, 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 ding. And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, 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 go. I'm cheering for that Bitcoin. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's at. I don't know if it's legal. I don't know if it's a Republican or a Democrat. I've never held one in my hand. I don't know if it's spiritual. I don't know if it's Muslim. I, but I've been rooting for it. I don't care where it is, what gender it is, what color it is, what religion it is. I just need it to do its thing. And if you get your money up into the house of God, you'll say, I don't care if it's a fast song or slow song, a girl preacher, man preacher, lady preacher, good preacher, ugly preacher. I just need it to go up because I'm invested. Where my treasure, I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. No, I'm not closing down my Robin Hood account. I got Bitcoin and that's supposed to go to the moon. And let me tell you something about what you're invested in. Bitcoin might go to the moon, but this thing called the kingdom of God is going beyond the stars so get invested get invested to the point that when it's going down you're hurting but you're in so deep you can't get out the only option you've got is to go long I gotta stay in till the value comes back up I'm in I'm in I'm in I'm in that's what you did Sunday night. That's what you're doing with your life is you're saying, I'm in. I'm so in, I can't do anything but get out, but stay in, and I can't get out. That's what you're doing. My treasure, look at your neighbors and say, my treasure's in it. Look at, say, tell your neighbors, my time is in it. My money's in it. Y'all didn't all say it. Look at your neighbors and say, my money's gonna be in it. My family's in it. My emotions are in this thing. Come on. I'm in it. I got no other backup plans. This is it for my emotions and my eternity. 
Hallelujah. I got way too much involved. to. I'm, I'm in way too deep to jump ship. Amen. My treasure's in it. My treasure's in it. Matthew chapter 6, as I continue teaching for the next 25 minutes, no man, Jesus says, can serve. For he will either hate one. Come on. And love the other. Or he'll to hold to the one and despise the other. And then he gets right down where the rubber meets the road to tell you what he's talking about, the, the two masters he's talking about. He said, you cannot serve God and money. The love of money is the root of all evil. How you acquire money has much to do with what you do with money. I've learned this just watching people in my life, Brother Sean. How it's acquired has a lot to do with how it is uh, turned. Um, if you took it, you'll spend it. If you earned it, you'll invest it. M most of the case. Now, there's some exceptions. But as a whole, if you stole it, you smoke it <laughs> or drink it. <laughs> so, uh, I looked over here because, you know, no, not, not trying, not, not, I didn't mean that. No, no hate TLC, but. <laughs> but they were all going, yeah. <laughs> if you inherit it, you'll pass it down. Blessed by it, you'll bless others with it. If you prayed for it, you'll tithe on it. If you got it easy, you lose it quickly. Old money, it's locked up in a fund somewhere. New money sitting on 37s out in the parking lot. First time money, you're wearing, wearing it or carrying it. <laughs> it's just how you make it that makes you determine what you do with it, and it defines you. And, and there's a few things that tell more about a person than what they do with their money. I said there's, you can learn more about a person about their, in their spending habits than you can Ancestry.com. I can save you some 23 and me money or whatever that is and just, just look at your, where you spend your money. That, that's really who you are. That's why I'm so glad I get to teach this on this Wednesday night because y'all just gave a whole lot of money. And it shapes who we are, our real intentions and motivations. And yet, with all of the power and influence of money, it's surprising how little we talk about it in the church. Isn't it? And really it's wrong since giving is linked to living. Since Jesus talked on it twice as much as any other subject and since it spoke of in hundreds of percentages more pretty much than any other subject and yet a clergy is fearful to talk about it. And, and so I, I, have to, I have to step up and say, you know what, I, I've, got to, I've got to start teaching on money. Amen? I've learned that unlearned people uh, uh, on money, they, they, they start valuing their image over investment. And I'm not here to teach you how to man. I'm not a financial planner that you go hire somebody. This isn't financial peace. You need to join that. But somebody not wise with their money will, will spend over save. They'll confuse cash for wealth. They'll think their credit score is a joke. They've, they've never been taught just because they've never been taught. I love Hope House. You know what Hope House is? Takes ladies and not, don't we don't just get them out of drugs. We start teaching them how to budget their money. Come on, if you don't know how to budget your money, you need to learn how to budget your money. And you can do that in Financial Peace University. Okay? And all of a sudden, you'll, you'll, you'll start caring. You know what I've noticed is unlearned people about money will care more about another man's brand on them than they do them. They will literally define themselves by another man's name who does not even share their values is probably doesn't hates their guts and you're literally paying more for the same item because it has his name on there but that's because you're just unlearned about money so you need mentorship you need somebody to teach you and if you were blessed to have a daddy a mom or somebody that told you about a 401k and explained the difference between a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA and you understood interest and compound interest and the importance of a savings and a checking account and how to balance those out you ought to just say thank you Jesus you know good debt versus bad debt you know when you should borrow when you should not borrow 
that's a good thing. And so most of us, I could say, because we were raised by good people, have a basic understanding of money in the economy and in our personal lives. However, as Christians, sometimes it seems like we struggle uh, to understand it within the context of our faith. Does that make sense? And I just think that, and I, and I do not lay that uh, as at your feet. I lay that partially at our feet and my feet is because we are, are good clergy is often intimidated and fearful to teach on money. And, and the reason is because of the bl bad clergy. I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be talking a little bit about money a lot this year because we, we're going to be giving like we never have. But one thing that's never going to happen this year is I'm going to say, well, I just feel like the first 17 people that put $17.17 in my left pocket are going to get blessed by $17 million. That's not going to happen. That, that's, that's not the way it works. I'm not trying to throw rocks at anybody. I'm just saying that we don't give. This isn't a get-rich-quick scheme. This isn't a, well, you just sow into my ministry and you'll have a Bentley tomorrow. No, the only one with a Bentley is me. <laughs> And we see that, and, and so clergy catches a bad rap because of a few idiots. And pardon my, my Cajun. <laughs> I, I can do that. That's Cajun word. Okay. And so the devil, uh, he knows. If I can get clergy intimidated, fearful to talk about money, and people will not give, and if they don't give, they don't live does that make sense I'm not going to be held captive by the devil's lies I love you guys I love you guys and we're going to talk about it yes there are men that take finances from the people and have done wrong but as a whole amen it is managed well and whether even even though even though there are some who have done wrong with the finances let me tell you something God has still blessed the giver God has still blessed the giver okay and so we can't get away from the fact that, that, that money is, is an issue in the Bible. What we did Sunday night was an incredible God thing. Uh, it was just an incredible, incredible, incredible thing. So I'm not going to spend more time teaching you about your marriage than I am talking about your money. We just got to talk about all of it. Amen? Amen. I said we're going to talk about all of it in Jesus' name. And so why give money to the church? First thing is it's not your money. I've got 16 minutes. Look at your neighbor and say it's not your money. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Number two, it's not given to the church, but it's given to the Lord. You have to believe that. If you have enough faith to believe that when you went down in that water tank filled with water and you came out, your sins were remitted, then you have to have the same amount of faith to say, when I give of my finances, I'm giving them unto the Lord. If you have enough faith to believe that when you're speaking in tongues, you're speaking in a heavenly language, if you can believe in invisible angels, then you have to have enough faith to believe that when you give of your money, you are giving it unto the Lord. Okay, I'm, look at your neighbor and say, I'm giving it to God. Yeah, but I'm practical and logical. And so I got to say, I just got to ask the obvious question, Brother Charles. Why does God need my money? Oh, boy, he's rich. <laughs> I mean, he's God. Seems like if he gave me money, it'd be my money. He could do without it. He don't need my money. So why, why do I need to give him something he don't need? Okay, let's look at it. I want to I look at that re real, real quick. Here's the reason why. The first one is when you give, it's an act that glorifies God. Okay, so it's more than the shout. When I give, it's not about him needing my money. It's about me giving him glory. It is more than the shout, more powerful than the amen, more powerful than the running of the aisles is giving is how I glorify God. No man can serve. He said, if there, he said there'll be competition. Listen, there'll be going to be competition. You can't serve two because they will compete. There'll be a competition between these masters. You, 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 and God said, I'm not, I'm not going to be in competition. But then he breaks down who the masters are. He says, you cannot serve God and, he didn't say food, because food's not in competition with God. He didn't say, no man can serve two masters, you, you can't serve God and your spouse. 
Your spouse is not in competition with God. He didn't call the other master a friend. Come on. Because your friends are not in competition with God. The only thing he mentioned, the singular thing he said that's in competition, the one thing he says that will be in competition with me is money. That's pretty incredible. He said what, what will compete with me is, and this is very powerful, he says money is my number one competitor. He said friends aren't my competitor, drugs aren't my competitor, lust is not my competitor, anger is not my competitor. No, the love of money is all of them. Money is my number one competition. That's powerful, isn't it? No wonder he talks so much about it. It's his number one comp competitor. It's his number one adversary is money. More than adultery, more than homosexuality, more than the devil. There's going to be more people in hell because of their love for money than because of satanic and demonic possession. Listen to me now, because I'm right. I'm not right. God's right. That's why I'm just, and this is amazing. Isn't it amazing how we beat? That's why you felt such a sense of victory Sunday night. And I, I went home and said, God, I don't want to live like that once a week, once a year. I want to live like that in a perpetual place. How do I do that? Getting complete victory over this thing called money. Isn't that awesome? Okay. He said, it's the number one thing competing against me. He said, so, so either you're going to serve God or you are going to serve money. Every little dollar you got, every little dollar in your pocket, every little dollar in your bank account, they're, they're, he's screaming. They got a little voice. Hey, make me your God. Trust in me. Believe in me. Let me open the doors for you. If you get enough of us, we can get you opportunities. Just get enough of us and we'll provide for you. Just get enough of, just have us. And if you love us, we'll take care of you. And you don't have to worry. We'll put you in front of important people. Come on, somebody. Again, I say unto you, Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because money is constantly saying, we'll do what God we're competing against God that's why when's the last time you saw a real rich man run the aisles because wealth can introduce this feeling of self-reliance come on whereas when you are poor there's a sense of dependence if God don't pay that bill <laughs> That bill ain't going to get paid. Oh, God, I'm going to shout for the glory because I need that bill to get paid. I'm depending on you, Jesus. I've got a 401K. I have a private plane. I have 13 slaves. I can always fire. I can sell two companies. I'm good. I'm good. Come on, somebody. I'm good to go. I don't need to go to church on Sunday. I don't have to be a Bible study. I don't. Why? Because I got money and I'm depending on the money. Come on. I need God. Money is not what I look to in time of need. Come on. And, and I, I understand currency. I understand dollars. But I'm going to operate on a different level of currency. And that's the currency of faith. Yes, I know we have to manage our money. Yes, I know you should have a savings account. But I, my dependency is not in my money. If you are depending on your money, if what brings peace into your heart is by looking at your bank accounts, uh, you're in the wrong business and you're in a bad place for you are put your faith uh, in mammon and you cannot put your trust in money. He says, I won't do it. He said, if you're going to trust in money, I won't be there. Come on, somebody. My next study will be what the average net worth is of a radical worshiper. And while I may not have all the details, I've got a feeling it's going to be pretty low. And then I'm going to do the net worth of the deadheads, and it's going to be kind of high. But you know what? I'm going to get my net worth up there real high and be with the radical worshipers to bring that one on up and just say, I, I might have, come on, and I'm not going to lie, I'm very blessed. 
I, could, I wish I could brag on it. And maybe one day I will. But I'm very, 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 very. You didn't buy the Tesla in the parking lot. Even though you blessed me. Thank you for it. I got a great business, Brother Dan. And you know what? I still run the aisles. And I still shout. And I still dance. Come on, somebody. I still live. I got a great business. But I'm a rat. Why? Because I'm not dependent on the Tesla. The Tesla might burn up the house. Might cave in. I'm not trusting in chariots. I'm not trusting in horses. My faith is in God. God. And when I put my trust in money, God says, I'm out. He said, I'm out. He said, I'm, I'm not going to be co God. I'm not going to be assistant God. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be God Jr. to your money. He said, if I'm not over all of it, I ain't in it. That's just what he's saying. Why are you telling this, Pastor? I'm telling it to you because what you did Sunday night is you said, God, you're over all of it. Amen? And so God will pull his hand off of it. And when you start worshiping something more than God and God's hand pulls off of it, all of a sudden you're in a situation that your God can't get you out of. Oh, I know you got it all, Mr. Steve Jobs. But you're 50, was it 54 and pancreatic cancer and all the money in the world. That thing that you had that was so secure, that had gave you so much peace, that opened doors for you and made ways for you and was going to never leave you or forsake you. All of a sudden it had no answer for you. Come on. And now your kids are walking out and your wife's gone and you got, where's the peace that it promised it would give you? Oh, I know you can pay the electric bill, but you got nobody in the house anymore. Who's going to give you peace now? Because you had the money, but you worshiped the money more than the giver of the money. And so the giver of the money said, I'm out because I ain't going to be second place to what I, the, what I gave you. He said, but if you'll keep me number one, I'll bless you. 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 Yeah, you can live in a nice heart. Yeah, you can be blessed. Yes, a percentage of your income can be, come on, given to this. And I'm not saying we don't live a blessed life. I live the most blessed life perhaps of all of us in the building. But what I'm saying is it's got to be a giving. Here's what where the equation is let it never be that what I receive from him is more than what I've given him because in grace he's already outgiven me I said in abundance he's outgiven me God doesn't owe me an electric bill payment God doesn't owe me anything he come on somebody matter of fact you know what he said to the backslider he said when you come back he said pay your tithe it literally says that you've robbed me, so repay me if you're coming back. Come on, that's the first message. God's convicted me all week. Come on, the next time I've got a backslider that prays through, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to say you need to pay your tithe. Y'all like, oh, you're going to get right to the money? Yes, I'm going to get right to the money because I learned in the Word of God that where you put your money, that's where your heart is. And you might have backslid once, but you won't backslide again because you're in. You're in all the way. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 The second thing is, as I move quickly, it gives order in my life. Amen, it gives governance, but it also gives order. It forces me to plan and structure your life. Amen? So I give to God, and it puts order in my life. It puts my life and my family in order. It puts my priorities in order. You know what I mean? I, before I'm out buying the Louis, I'm, I'm making sure Jesus is taken care of. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not saying you can't have them both. I'm just saying... If you got to pick between one, make the priority God. And I, I'm going to tell you, if you put him first, if you put him first, so give because it's, a, it's, it's getting things in order. The, the third thing is giving is an act of godliness. I think there's nothing you can do more godly than give. We talk a lot about sounding and looking but as far as doing, one of the most God things to do is to give. For God so loved the world that he, every good and perfect gift comes from 
No good thing, the Bible says, will God withhold. He says he, he desires to... If you don't desire to give, you get up in that altar, baby. Get prayed through back to the Holy Ghost, amen? Come on. Hallelujah. And so there's few ways I'm more Christ-like than when I'm giving. I'm skipping a, uh, quite a bit here. The next thing is giving is an act of generosity. And it's amazing that, that to me, this is an amazing thing that, that, that the church is this one thing you join and expect it to be free. It's like the only thing in the whole world. Literally, the only thing in the whole world people join and like, what? I gotta, I gotta pay? Can, is that your attitude at the gym? And you don't even go there. Like, like, it's just on your bank statement to give you peace, like make you feel good. Yeah, I got a gym membership. They're like, yeah, they closed six months ago. They just still charging you, baby. <laughs> Little League, $883 a year. I know, no, and yet there's no, like, riots. I can't believe for the well-being of our children that they're charging them to play a stupid, idiotic little game where all they have is a piece of wood and hit a piece of leather. They're charging money to do... There's none of that. Like, oh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. Well, little dribblers. They, are they letting you do that for free? No, no, it's $449 a year. That's without all the gear, the LeBrons you have to buy. Come on. I'm just talking. Marching band. I'm looking these up on the Internet. $990 a year. Not nine 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 dollars and nine nine hundred and nine almost one thousand. Color guard six hundred. YMCA. You think they got a song that they made enough royalties off that not to charge you as a membership? But <laughs> they gonna charge you. How about your Amazon Prime? Anybody got the Amazon Prime? Anybody? Just raise your hand if you got the Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. They charge you. Now here's the one, brother Leha really matters. NRA. Y'all, I know we on the internet, y'all like, oh, no. <laughs> Even the AARP, you, they paying you to be old. They're making you pay to be old. Freemasons, they charge. And the word free is in their, in their name. And yet they charge, Brother Tommy. Membership dues. Monthly coffee bean subscription from around the world you get. Boy, I like it. I got one. They're awesome. They send me coffee beans from all over the world, different flavors. It's amazing. Okay? But they charge. You know what happens? You, know, you know what happens if you don't pay? Now, this is going to blow your minds. This is a mind blower right here. If you don't pay your membership dues to the gym by the time you know what happens? You want to show up with your little card? And they're going to say, sorry, sir, you haven't been paying your dues. And you're not going to be like, you know what? I don't think I should have to pay my dues after. You know what? My, 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 I drive by this place all the time. I come in here all the time and look at it. You don't have an attitude. You're like, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot to pay my dues. Let me pay back up. Pay. Oh, oh, there's a penalty? Oh, pay the penalty, too. Come on, somebody. You know what happens if I don't pay my coffee bean subscription every month? I don't get no coffee beans in the mail. And I don't get an attitude about it. I actually don't expect to get coffee beans in the mail. If I get them and I didn't pay, I actually stole them. Because <laughs> I promised I was going to pay for them. It's just an, I'm just doing a little autopsy here tonight. And I, it's, it's funny, you know, as I, as I look through the, and dissect the spiritual bodies of those who've backslidden, I see people who've given more to organizations they value less. I'm just doing, a, just doing an autopsy. They give more to places they go less. They'll wear uniforms and be a part of a team they care less for than the church, but they won't put on an usher coat. 
They'll give to the animal shelter, and that's great, save home 18 homeless kit kittens, but refuse to serve on a first responder team that's baptized 148 in Jesus' name. They'll give to the Salvation Army, but won't support the Hope House. They'll sponsor a child in Africa, but won't give to the missions and help us build an orphanage in Zambia. They'll help one widow buy a wheelchair, but won't give alms to help them weekly. They'll buy one poor kid some candy, but won't join the bus ministry team and pick them up weekly. I'm just talking about this is, the, this is what I dissected and I discovered. The, 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 they'll serve the homeless man at Thanksgiving a meal in a soup line while the television you know, channel 12 is there. But every Sunday we serve them here at Eastgate Church. Every Sunday, hundreds of people, thousands, millions of dollars flow through this place helping our community. That's an incredible thing, isn't it? I took the numbers of those who left and those who are here. Um, went back five years to those that have prayed through and that are still here today. I think it's pretty solid numbers, a little rough. But the math was that, that if you pay your tithe and offering, give to missions, alms, and are faithful in attendance, 80% of the church services. Based on the five-year numbers, those who have joined, their odds go up to 80%. Okay? That's 80%. Um, now, if you add 60% attendance of social activities and serving in at least two volunteer ministries and, and uh, uh, like ushers, connect team, choir, something like that, your odds go up to 97%. These are not emotional things. These are just the numbers of the last five years. People that started coming five years ago that got involved. 80% of those, they didn't really get involved, but they did do all those things. There's 80% of them are still here. Does that make sense? 97% of the people that got did all those things I just are still here and if I looked into 3% I guarantee you they're transfers I didn't look that deep I didn't have enough time okay 97 those completely uninvolved that did not give at all that are not faithful do not contribute financially 0% of them are here five years later Those who did exactly what I'm preaching to you tonight, 97% of them are still here. What are you saying? Pastor, preach and tell me to give. Pastor, don't stop pushing me to get involved. Let's do Beyond Borders every Sunday. I want to get in. I want to get in. Don't get ugly at me. Don't get mad at me when I'm like, come on, let's give. Come on, let's get involved. Hey, come on, join a ministry team. Get in the choir. Hey, I want you to come early for prayer. Hey, come on, come on. Why are you doing that? Because I want you to live. Because my job, my duty and responsibility is to get you to heaven, Jeff. Get in this thing. Get in it with all your heart. Don't be a spectator. If you're one of the statistics, thank God you're still here. If you're just kid or miss and casual, it's time to get in. You can't afford not to give of your tithing and of your offering. You can't afford not to get into this thing. Come on, I'm going to go with a 97% odds over a zero, 100% chance of failure. So tonight, I want to make a quick altar call. I want to do it a little different. If you have a job, retirement 401k, if you have investments accounts and own a home, if you have a savings account, I want you to come and gather around this front. This isn't for the broken. It's easy to call those. They're desperate. They're dependent. They need this altar call. But, but you are too. You are too. I am too. I am too. Sure, I know you got a portfolio and a rent house and a backup house and this house. And, but I wonder as we gather around here tonight, as we can say, wow, I've looked at the, the autopsy. I've seen and dissected the organs and looked at the contributions and I've looked at the attendance, the involvement. And I realize that, that I'm in a good place, that the devil's a liar. Because here's what he'll tell you. You're doing too much. You know what you're gonna do? You're gonna you're gonna burn out. You're gonna, oh man, you're just, you know, you're you're, you're gonna you're gonna wear out. Did he did he did he tell you the same thing when you were at the club at four o'clock in the morning? Did, did did the burnout devil ever show up when you were at the ball game screaming? Hey, you probably shouldn't scream. You're gonna throw your voice out. And you're gonna need that tomorrow at work. Did he ever? Did he? Has he ever shown up on the side of the road with the crackhead and say, "You know what? You're really gonna ruin your life." No, he said, "Do more, do more, do more, do more, do more, do more." Come on, somebody. 
they shall run and not grow weary. There is something that God says, the more I give, the more he gives into me. The way I die is actually when the numbers are out of balance. When what I'm getting is more than what I'm giving, I'm on my way to dying. So don't you worry about burning out. You better worry about drowning in the blessings of God and say, I'm going to be a funnel. I'm going to give to God. And I wonder tonight if you could just lift your hands. Come on, Eastgate. I love you guys so incredibly much. As your pastor, I apologize for not preaching about money more. It's, it's an insecurity and a fear, but God convicted me. And I want you to know I love you. Come on, I don't need it personally, but I believe you need it personally. I'm grateful that you bless us. I thank you for giving to the kingdom of God. But it's for your own blessing. It really is. Your survival and our well-being and the prosperity of our, our spiritual being is linked to what we give, not just money, but also of your time. Come on, if you're here and you think you can just buy your way in, that's wrong too. He wants your talent. He wants your ministry. He wants your voice. He wants your song. Come on, make your life revolve around this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's it, God. Thank you. Thank you tonight for allowing us to to dissect, open up, and look and evaluate so that we can be educated and live more, Father, favorably and according to your word. God, I do pray for those, Father, Lord, that have gone that it did not contribute did not participate uh, that they would make up their minds when I come home uh, when I come back uh, I'm going to get in this thing with all I've got with all my heart soul mind and strength Uh, come on that's what he said you do if you're going to live for me Uh, he said give me all your heart give me all your soul give me all your strength give me all your might Uh, give me everything you've got give 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 that's the first and greatest commandment Uh, hallelujah hallelujah that's it I love you, Jesus. Come on, I I wonder if I got somebody blessed. You got a rent house, and you could just say, God, I I bless you, Lord. I praise you. I wonder if I got somebody. Come on, you're about to retire. Come on, you got enough in that retirement account to keep you happy till the day you die and leave some for your kids. You ought to give God some praise. Come on, I'm not asking you for that. I'm not saying you have to give that. I'm just saying you've got to, you can't trust in that. Come on, don't you depend on your 401k. Don't put your faith and horses and chariots but put it in and remember the name of the Lord our God hallelujah 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 our great nation needs to remember its wealth comes because we've created because our nation is founded on God and the minute that we pull God out you watch that wealth dry up don't put your faith and mammon our faith is in God pastor and you know what's hard God told Moses he said receive it I'll tell you what was hard for for me I was going in there on Monday I've been so sick but I went in and I'm looking at what some of y'all gave young people our kids tears started stream, sister Libby started streaming down my face elderly ladies and fixed income and I don't know well, I see what you're paying tithe. I don't know what you're making I'm like my God and I'll be honest with you the flesh in me you know, what, you know what I really want to do I want to call you up and say hey it's okay I got you I'll, I'll cover yours And I, but I got to so many I was like I can't cover all of these <laughs> went home and I started praying God to bless you guys and and God said receive it for they've given it unto the Lord I'm going to take care of them and I want you to know God's going to take care of you and as I've dissected the backslider maybe one day I'll dissect the giver Brother Roger am I right has he given you pressed down shaken together and running over Is there anybody here that says, I've given and God has just poured out into my life. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. It's just never failed.